Hey everyone, I'm Jack with River Jack Studio, and in this video I take a used Buffalo Trace bourbon barrel and turn it into an end-grain cutting board. That spins. First I gotta get some beauty shots of the barrel I picked up. My dog dude was chasing the barrel around the yard and I ended up bribing him with some treats to stay on top of it to get some pictures for the thumbnail, and he was not a fan. I kinda goofed when I picked the barrel up. I just chucked it into the back of my truck thinking it would be fine rolling around in the back. But as I made the trip back to my house and the barrel was rolling around a little harder and harder in the back of my truck, um, the ring started to slide off and the barrel com completely collapsed into a pile of staves. I was super bummed uh, when I dropped the tailgate and to see the barrel had broken apart and I really wanted to make a fun intro taking it apart and getting all the cinematic shots of the staves falling around in a circle. So I ended up grabbing a beer and going on YouTube to watch an Irishman at a distillery put a barrel together. And then I attempted to do the same thing. And he made it look so much easier. Um, it was literally a 15 minute video and he told stories the whole time while also drinking whiskey. So I thought, oh, this will be easy to get done. And it took me like two hours to get the barrel back together. Dude didn't like me beating on the barrel, so he went off frolicking in my neighbor's yard and tear up sticks, which is his true calling in life. After I got the barrel torn down, I grabbed the last hoop from the top and presto, my 30 seconds of fame. I grabbed all the staves and laid everything on my bench. There's generally 31 to 33 staves in a barrel with a variety of thicknesses to make that circumference. Because of this, you might be wondering how I plan to make this cutting board out of very curved wood. And the answer is I'm going to have to plane and cut down every single stave. I started with my miter saw and cut around a 4 inch chunk out of the middle. These staves had the radius bent mostly from the middle, so cutting that out generally flattened the pieces out. My shop started to really smell like bourbon at this point. So from 32 staves I now had 64 pieces and some chunks cut out of the middle which I would end up using in the smoker later on. I then needed to flatten one side of the staves so I used my joiner and took one 30 second passes off until one side was completely flat. This took forever. I stood at that joiner for what felt like a lifetime, and anything you could think to contemplate, I contemplated. After I'd gotten all those pieces through and one side was completely flat, I then sent all the pieces through the planer. Again, standing there for what felt like an eternity, not only did I have to do that, but I had to edit me standing there the whole time. Since some pieces were flatter than others, I had to separate them out into thickness groups uh, that were sent through the planer together, which would be important later on when gluing them up. So Buffalo Trace is a bourbon distillery located a couple hours away from me in Frankfort, Kentucky, and is one of the oldest bourbon distilleries in the country. If you didn't know, one of the unique things about bourbon casks is that you can't reuse bourbon barrels. So there's generally plenty of third-party sellers you can pick them up from, at least where I live. Well, after the pieces were perfectly flat, the edges still weren't, due to the staves having angled edges to be able to make that turns for the barrel sides. So I head back to the joiner and this time turn the stave on a 90 degree edge. Doing this does take a lot of the outside weathering and chart inside off the staves, but there is still some residual that wasn't completely taken off by the tools. After this was completed, I then needed to square up the last side of the stave, so I used my table saw, and by putting the jointed side on the fence, I ripped the last angled portion off. After I ran all the pieces through, I had my stacks ready to glue up. Bourbon barrels are made from American white oak, Quercus alba. The reason being white oak is closed grain wood, which makes it slightly more water resistant than the other types of wood species. Specifically, the American white oak pores of the heartwood are typically plugged with tylosis, which is a membranous growth. Tylosis makes white oak impenetrable to liquids, which is also why a lot of wood chips use white oak, along with the barrel industry and outdoor furniture. Oaks are typically divided into two groups, white oaks, which have leaves with rounded lobes, and red oaks, which have leaves with bristle-tipped lobes. There's over 400 species of oak in the northern hemisphere, so when someone says it's oak, it could mean a lot of different things. However, American white oak is extremely popular wood to use, and therefore is usually the poster child for the oaks. So I have the staves organized by size, and I grab enough pieces out of each group to make a 10 inch wide panel. Because I'll need to plane them down again and my planner can only do pieces 13 inches wide max. I also needed the overall width of the board to be about 20 inches to get my final dimensions, so I would end up gluing two of these 10 inch panels together later on. I also mix up the pieces so the weathering and charred parts are dispersed around, along with the different widths to make it random. <laughs> 
I then grab my glue, which will be type on three due to its waterproofing, as it will need to be for this cutting board. We don't want moisture to delaminate it down the road, especially considering how many glue ups I'll end up having. I glue up the pieces, making sure it's pretty well flat. It doesn't have to be perfect as it'll be flattened again. In total, I have 10 of these panels, making sure that the numbered ends can match with an adjacent 10 inch panel uh, to create those 20 inch wide panels in the end. I even do two panels at a time and just not adding glue down the middle pieces and using calls to make sure the area is wide and pretty flat, mostly because I was running out of clamps at this point. After a full day, I come back and undo all my clamps. I just switched the blades in my planer and joiner, so I went ahead and scraped as much of that residual glue off as I could. I then sent every panel through the planer, making sure to keep the same thickness for each group that I would later on glue up. I probably only ended up taking about a 30 second off on each side, which wasn't bad and didn't really reduce my overall thickness and have a lot of waste. As I talked about earlier, one of the rules of bourbon is it must be aged in a charred new oak barrel. Charring the wood staves inside each one releases faint flavors of toasted caramel and vanilla that infuse with the bourbon. Bourbon barrels can only be used once for bourbon, but a lot of scotch and whiskey producers are happy to use them afterwards. I got to take a trip to Ireland in my undergrad, and I was really surprised to see how many bourbon barrels they use for their whiskey production in a different country. Um, but they had barrels from distilleries that literally were in the same town as me. My degree is in wildlife ecology, so I've taken a bunch of botany and plant related courses. And my interest in woodworking and seeing all the types of wood is kind of spurred from that. One final I had in my plant taxonomy course was to identify 110 species of plants while on a hike at a nature preserve that my university owned. The preserve had almost every species of oak native Kentucky due to the property going from moist bottomland forest to more of an upland area. Just including the white oaks, we had white, swamp, burr, post, and chinkapin, not to include the other seven types of red oak we also had. Overall, about 20 species of oak are thought to be native to Kentucky, and my professor was actually a forestry guy for a long time, so he knew the trees even by their bark, which was always wild to me because I think all bark looks exactly the same. I then took the panels to the joiner and joined one side that would be later on glued up, just because the clamps had exerted some pressure and deformed it just a little bit, and I wanted a clean straight edge. I was now ready for my second glue up. I then set my clamps up, and because I couldn't send these larger 20 inch panels through the planer, I made sure after gluing them that I thoroughly wiped down all the excess glue, and added calls to make sure they were perfectly flat just so they weren't deformed when they set up. The oak used in these barrels are also quarter sawn, which is a different method of cutting logs to make sure the grain is perfectly oriented, which reduces cupping and deformation, which is important in making sure that staves don't deform and remain tight bond in the barrels to keep it from leaking their contents. This method of cutting the tree also results in being able to see the medullary rays, which are specialized structures that move nutrients between the growth rings. This feature is highly sought after in the woodworking world, and this type of lumber is usually much more expensive due to more waste being generated cutting logs this way. Less overall dimensional lumber can be taken from a log that is quarter sawn compared to more traditional methods, such as flat sawn. I came back and scraped off all the excess glue on my workbench and undid all my clamps. And now I had six perfectly flat panels. The oak genus Quercus, uh, with many of its species, is one of the most important groups of hardwoods found in North America. The central and southern hardwood forests of the United States are often called oak forests, with other hardwood species kind of playing a secondary role. As much as 80% of Kentucky forests are dominated by oaks. The acorns that the oaks produce are also a really important food source for several kinds of wildlife. Several species that have sweet acorns were also used by food for Native Americans. I scraped off the black parts that the glue reacted with the cast iron pipe and then sanded down those areas so that they would be perfectly flat again. It didn't need to be perfect, but this would be hidden on in the last glue up anyway. I then needed to make the bottom side of the panel straight to be able to run them through my table saw to get the final thickness. So I took my track saw and using a speed square I lined up my track to cut a straight line across each panel. I then repeated the process to all the other pieces and I was ready for the final cut. 
I wanted a pretty thick board, almost like a butcher's block, so I ended up setting my guide at two and a quarter inches, which would save me later down the road going that thick. I ended up mixing all the strips so that I would have a random pattern of ingrain throughout and wouldn't have any repeating pieces. Because I was going to make this board into a circle, I wanted to cut off as much excess as I could before the glue up to not waste as much of the oak. I then took some pieces over to my miter saw and cut off a certain amount in groups to continue making the circle while reducing the overall waste that I would have. I then marked the orientation with a pen so I could line it up again while gluing up the board. Because I had made the strips different lengths, I couldn't just set all the pieces on clamps and just slowly glue everything together. So I decided just to spread everything out on my table and coat everything in glue. Was this my smartest idea? Definitely not, but it seemed to work and who could really say. So I just took several strips, coated it in glue, smeared it all over everything, making sure to get good coverage, and I repeated the process until I had every piece absolutely coated in glue. I then grabbed a million clamps and began squeezing out the excess, which there was a lot of. I put pretty much every clamp I owned on the board just because of how much surface area there was and how much pressure I needed to put on the board to get it to form up correctly. One of the reasons I chose to do ingrain was the orientation of the wood fibers, which will receive a blade better than the long edge of wood planks on traditional cutting boards. Because the blade is being caught between the natural separation of the fibers, they'll close back up over time. End grain boards carry a reputation for being self-healing because of this. As a result, sharp knives usually don't make permanent, lasting cuts in the wood. Cuts that quickly can be filled with bacteria and eventually rot from the inside out. It also just looks better, I think. Some downside is that the porosity is much higher in end grain, so it'll soak up anything that comes into contact with it which is another reason why finishing is so important on these boards. I then waited another day and lifted the behemoth of a board up onto my table and removed all the clamps. I looked over the board and I'd squeeze out pretty much at every glue joint, which I was very thankful for. Any gaps would have potentially ruined the board and I would have had to spend a lot more time fixing my mistakes. I took my chisel and began scraping off as much excess glue as I could before I would flatten it. I obviously couldn't send it through the planer, it was just way too big, and end grain is really tough on blades, yet alone on hard white oak. So I'd go ahead and grab my router and a flattening bit. I'd then make light passes with my router and make one side completely flat and then do the same to the other side. I needed to take really shallow passes at the end once I removed the majority of the material, just because end grain will tear out and leave rough pitted finishes across the surface even when it's completely flat. Once I had my chunk of a flat board, I then needed to turn it into a circle. So I again used my router with its plunge base and a acrylic circle jig attached to it. The jig has a pin in the center that slides and I can just measure the radius that I want and find the middle of my board. And using a tape and hammer, I then place the pin in the middle of the board, ensuring that the edge of my straight router bit made contact all the way around. I've never used a circle jig before, so this would be a learning experience on camera, unfortunately, which we'll both find out why I have no idea what I'm doing very quickly. I then set my gauge to insert the bit. I take my first pass very carefully and make it almost all the way around and then disaster. The cord on my router got caught by the end of my jig and popped the center pin guiding my router out. Tragic but I just continue on and get about three quarters of the way through. I don't want to tear out, so I stop before getting all the way through. I then take my jigsaw and cut off the excess pieces so I can use my smaller router with a flush cut bit to get the excess material off. Since I had made that small nick, this project was clearly ruined, so I just decided to burn it and start from scratch. No, I'm just kidding. I went back to the slab table and flattened it once more, taking the overall thickness down to about 2 inches. 
Since this would be a cutting board butcher's block of sorts, I wanted to add a juice groove, which you would think would be difficult on a circle, but again using my circle jig and a rounded bit, I added a perfect groove all the way around, making sure to take very light passes and also paying attention to where my cord was so I didn't have another screw up because I really didn't want to flatten this thing for a third time. I then wanted to add some more dimensions and get rid of the, all the sharp edges on the side. So I took my chamfer bit and added a chamfer all the way around on both sides. And, and now time for my favorite thing in the entire world, sanding. Because this was ingrained and was a cutting board that would get water contact, I needed to make sure the seams wouldn't pop. So I sanded like crazy and popped the grain in between every grit with my water bottle. I started relatively low with 60 grit and just because of how hard in grain oak is, I did 60 twice. I then moved to 80 grit going all the way to 320 on my final sanding. I took a block and added the lower grit sandpaper to avoid divots when I was doing the sides chamfer and then would sand the juice groove by hand with paper. This was in some respects actually easier than doing a traditional cutting board just because I didn't have any edges, which usually causes routers to burn in the corners, so this went pretty quickly. I did these steps over and over and over again for what felt like eternity, but was probably only about three to four hours. It was now time for the magical moment, adding the mineral oil. I got a nice beauty shot of me adding the mineral oil, but in reality, I just ended up dunking it into a bath and let it sit overnight just because of how massive this thing is and how much would eventually soak into the board. After leaving it for a day, I came back and did my final step in the finishing process, which was to add a thick application of beeswax. Cutting boards use mineral oil because it seeps into the wood to offer a bit of protection against changes in the humidity which makes the wood less susceptible to cracking or warping. It also enhances the aesthetics of the woods by adding volume to the grain and enhancing the natural color of the wood. The wax, however, acts as a physical barrier on the surface of the wood that protects against stains and liquids. The wax also aids in sanitation as it fills and seals in knife scars and microscopic cracks where the bacteria would otherwise gather and grow. Because this board was so massive and round, I thought it'd be cool to add a Lazy Susan ring to be able to reach around and utilize all parts of the board. Because the ring was only 14 inches in diameter compared to the 20 inch board, you could have it overhang off your counter a little bit so you can be right over the top of it or be able to scrape scraps off into the trash underneath it. I made sure it was perfectly centered so I wouldn't have any wobble and got it within one millimeter on all sides, which I was surprised at how easy it was to be able to center. The board ended up weighing at 18 pounds, so it wouldn't be able to wobble over either. You pretty much have to put your entire weight on the edge of it for it to tip. I'd use it as a cutting board, but it can also be used as a serving tray or a centerpiece. You can even take the Lazy Susan off and just have it be stationary. The end grain look is super cool along with being able to see the charred and weathered parts in the board. This thing took a lot of time and effort, but I'm really happy with how it turned out. Even after the wax and mineral oil treatment, if you put your nose up to it, you can still smell the buffalo trace, which is really cool. I even made a terrible infomercial about it if you all want to check it out on either my Instagram link below or a short I posted to YouTube. It is still for sale on my Etsy, which is also linked before. I also have a traditional one made from the scraps of this project for sale, as well as being a bit cheaper. Thanks everyone for watching. I'd appreciate it if you all like, comment, and subscribe for more woodworking content. Down in the comments, let me know what you all think, and I'll see you all next week.